Hello everyone and welcome back. I got an interesting one for you today. Here's a trauma case. This is the image that was sent to me by the general dentist. 11 year old kid took a header off of a scooter, had this complicated crown fracture. This is three days before I was able to get him into my office. The general dentist went and placed an IRM direct pulp cap with some composite on top of there and we are going to be doing a spec pulpotomy today. So first thing we need to do is remove that existing composite because I want to get the IRM out of there. Well, it is a great temporary material, long term it can cause pulpal necrosis and some other issues. So I'm going to do something with uh, bioceramic material instead, a little more modern as far as the filling material here. You'll notice I'm not using water, I'm not really putting a lot of pressure on the tooth. I'm not worried about it heating up here. Mostly what I'm doing is just removing the composite and having it dry allows me to see that a little bit better. You can also see I'm doing a stair step approach and beveling the buccal enamel. Shout out to Dr. Geisberger from UOP for teaching us this one way, way back when, but it kind of helps hide that transition between the composite and the enamel itself. So at this point, I am now going into the area where I expect the nerve to be. So we're going to drop into the IRM here. You'll see that white powder material right there. And going to go ahead and start this vec pulpotomy. Now we know that bacteria travel at about three, a millimeter a day. So I want to remove about three millimeters of the coronal pulp tissue. And that's what we're doing here. Just going to rinse that out, make sure there's no restorative material. And that's kind of what that nice healthy pulp looks like. And I'm just popping out that last little piece of IRM there. Now, when we look at the tooth right now, this is the the axis that we have done. The problem is we need to get the extent, we need to extend out and grab the entire thing. So you are going to see me expand the axis to this area. The reason why is because we need to make sure we remove the extent of the pulp tissue. Like I said, I'm going to go down about three millimeters to do that spec pulpotomy. And so that's what we're going to be doing next is removing just a little bit more. And yes, I have been playing around with fusion. <laughs> so here's what that looks like. Uh, you can see nice healthy tissue. It's not bleeding too much. Um, you will notice it's not quite as solid as it would be if it had just been fresh. And I think that's because the IRM was already starting to have a little bit of a necrosing effect on that area. So I'm gonna drop it down like we talked about, um, going in and this is pretty much what it looks like um, as we dry everything off. So get all that debris out of there. And I'm gonna put EDTA on top of there. I used to use bleach, but we've recent studies have shown EDTA is better at releasing stem cells. Um, a few moments later and voila a few minutes later i let it soak in there for about a minute or two we have nice healthy tissue um you can see what i was talking about the tissue isn't quite as solid as it would be normally so i'm just using the back end of a paper point to help make sure we compact everything down um, i did a few more of these i decided to cut it because you kind of get the concept and we're going to go in with brassler's root uh root repair material that's hard to say actually <laughs> i actually found that the glick the side of it the paddle was actually perfect to kind of condense it in here i am going to use my regular bnl condenser here just to kind of make sure we push down to the extent of what I've removed. But the key here is that because we know bacteria travel at a certain rate, you can get a rough idea of how much of the pulp tissue you would want to remove. With our modern materials, we can probably get away with a little bit more. Um, but because I... I just have problems with IRM causing really nasty necrosis. I felt it was better in this case to remove a little bit more, be a little more aggressive on the removal of the actual pulp tissue because we can fill this up with a nice BC putty and just get a really rock solid um, a result here. So I'm going to pop that in here. Now, the one problem with BC putty is it does take about 15 to 30 minutes to set up. So I'm not going to leave that this kid was ready to go at this point. We're about three minutes into the appointment. He was ready to get out of here as soon as possible. So um, <laughs> the, you need to cover it. So first thing you're going to do is take a dry cotton pellet and just remove any excess. You want to expose that. Do not etch. Do not etch. Do not etch. Do not etch. Um, etch is the one thing that will kill pulps like nobody's business. So I'm putting vitriven on here. It is a 3M product. I have used it for years. I absolutely love it. Um, choose whatever your favorite unfilled glass ionomer is because it has some innate dentin bonding ability, which is super cool. And what I'm doing here is I know that we, it, it, however, it doesn't bond to composite. So that's one of the issues with it. So I'm using the Endo Explorer and just a little air only here to remove it from the interproximal area because like I said, I am going to be restoring this one as well. Go ahead and cure it like you normally would. And then what you want to do is go back in with a diamond and remove any part that could be on the exposed enamel uh, because we are relying very heavily on enamel bonding for this because he's got such a great area there. The bevels have also helped. Um, I did bevel the lingual off the off camera that I kind of cut it out there. Um, but we're going to go through the normal process like we do for any filling, disclose, blast off the uh, nastiness there. All right, this is what the actual matrix band looks like. And 
it comes with this area fully intact. So you want to, on really healthy cases, you actually want to cut out this little triangle to make sure that it's going to fit better with the actual gingiva. On cases that are more broken down, if the gum tissue is broken down a little bit, if it's not quite as intact, it works perfectly to keep it here. But this is a trick if you're working on younger patients and they have that really healthy interproximal papilla, you actually want to remove this little triangular shape to give enough space so that it fits inside there. And so this is what it looks like inside the mouth, fits down nicely. You can see we get a really good, solid, snug, tight th fit there. Before I tried to fit it in there and it would, the, the gum tissue was so tight it would actually push it back out. So we don't want that. I decided to use a wedge here because I couldn't get a really solid fit inside there. So normally you don't have to use wedges with this. I decided to here. Um, this is all the BioClear system. Go in with our total etch at this point. Now I'm not worried about doing the etch because we have that nice vitro bond on top of there. It's going to help protect the tooth from uh, any of that negative um, pulpal effects inside there. Go in here with our prime like we would normally. Um, for the BioClear system, you want to actually use a little bit of extra. Same thing with the bond. This helps kind of lubricate for the flowable and the packable composite when you injection mold inside here. So this is heated 3M Filtic Supreme Ultra Flow um, flowable composite. This is shade A1. Going to fill that up because kind of roughly the size of it. And then I'm going to come in here with the packable right after. Um, I used a combination of A2 and A1 because he was kind of in between. Um, not super pleased with how the final look looks, but you'll see why in a minute why we actually had issues with that. Um, part of it is because I'm out of my preferred composite, so I had to use some Shofu stuff, some samples that I had here. But you can see as we go inside here, now I'm using my fingers to kind of help shape the composite and make sure that we're flush with the lingual. I'm going to use the Glick along the buckle to help make sure that's solid there. And then we're going to go ahead and have the system come in and light here. Now, normally what you would do is have a matrix band on both sides, but because his tooth was so intact on the distal, I felt it was better just to have one on top of here. You want to do a couple cures on this, make sure it's rock solid. And what I'm going to do here is you'll see me come in with a mirror. This is the perfect time if I need to add composite. I'm checking to see where that buckle or the facial extent of the composite is. If it's under contoured, now is the time to add it because we still have that oxygen inhibited layer that I can go inside and bond to very effectively. So when we are polishing teeth like this, the first thing you want to do is establish those incisal edges. So I'm getting number nine close to where I want eight to be. He had also chipped off Eight. Uh, you can see on the mesial, he's got a little bit of a curve there. So I'm going to flatten that out for him, get both of the teeth looking as symmetrical as possible. Remember, it's okay to adjust the tooth next to it, the one that you're working on, because you want to get both the teeth as perfect as possible. And sometimes with trauma, they can have some weird little chips on the surrounding teeth. So it's nice to go in and just quickly kind of smooth those off for them as well. I'm doing the bulk removal here with an extra coarse burr because I, A, it's more efficient, um, but B, I like having the little scratches on there for when I go into polish so I can see if there's the contours off at all. This is what I was talking about. Just a quick, small little adjustment. You can already see how much better eight looks by just adjusting that. So I didn't barely remove any composite there or any tooth structure and it already looks much better. Going to use that barrel burr now to do the lingual contour. So I try to do as much as possible with rubber dam on. It's just a lot easier. You don't have to deal with the tongue, the lips, anything like that. Um, and this is just kind of, I'm looking at number eight for the idea of where I want all of the extensions to be as far as the line angles and the cingulum and everything like that. So that's what we're doing in this process. You know, he has problem is he has a pretty much 100% overbite, and you'll see why that becomes an issue here. Uh, next thing I like to do is with the rubber dam off, work on those gingival embrasures. Uh, the reason I like doing it with off is because I want to see where his eyes are and check the midline with his eyes as well. And now we're finally going in with the polishing burr. So I like using this flame burr to establish my line angles as well as just start to smooth off any of the rough spots. And you can see when you do this dry, um, the nice part is when you do it dry, you can see exactly where the marks were from the previous one. Um, fine tuning of that uh, incisal embrasure now with my favorite burr of all time, the little mosquito. So this super fine burr is really nice for getting just a nice mirrored image on the two of them. And you can see I'm kind of still smoothing out that chip on number eight where there are some issues as well. But the idea is you want to get eight and nine as perfectly symmetrical as possible. If seven and 10 look a little bit off, no one notices. If eight and nine aren't perfect, everybody notices. So at this point, happy with everything, gonna go in with the BioClear Magic Mix, which is kind of like a profi paste, but it does a nice job of smoothing off those surface scratches. And then we finally come in with the Rockstar Polisher, which makes just an absolute beautiful result. So you'll see in the finish here, um, some of that color change, it's kind of just because of the really bright light. If you see it with a photo, it's not quite as obvious that transition 
transition between the composite and the tooth structure itself. So it turned out looking really good. Um, patient actually wanted me to leave it broken. He's a hockey player and he said it makes him look tough. And I was like, well, you're 11, dude. <laughs> you need to <laughs> not do this. So um, go ahead and go ahead and check the bite. And then that's pretty much it. And actually it's not because what happened is as he moved forward, he broke the tooth off like that broke the filling off that this is the whole problem is he didn't actually hit because of that super deep bite he ended up breaking that off so what's going on here so what is going on here is a couple different things the first part was that he had almost a complete overbite so as soon as he started pushing forward and moving protrusively off came the composite. That was the first issue that was going on there. So we adjusted a couple different things. I softened a couple of the mammalons on his lower teeth. And then I also made eight just a little bit shorter as well. Remember, he did want me to leave it broken down. So he was actually happy that it looked a little bit different. Um, this kid's going to break his tooth again. There's no doubt about it. That's why I went a little bit more aggressive with the spec potomy as well, is to remove a little bit more tooth structure. So in case he breaks more, hopefully it's still going to be in the putty and the pulp will still be protected. The second problem was my mistake. And with the clear fill, I should have air thinned and cured it. With the technique as prescribed by Dr. Clark, you generally don't have to light cure the type of bonding agent he had. In this case, though, I think that was the problem. Without air thinning and getting that nice light cured area for the composite to bond onto, I think that's what killed the bond strength. Um, that would be most likely what happened. What ended up happening in this case is I had two other patients show up at the same time. So <laughs> thankfully, the kid wanted a break anyway. I was able to go take care of both of the other patients. Both of them didn't need treatment. So we were able to get back and finish up the case on this kiddo. But by that point, we were all a little bit frustrated. So I didn't record anymore. But we did get a nice final result. I'm going to show you the pictures here in just a moment. You can see aesthetically, it looks good. Um, I was, I, I did shorten the incise ledge a little bit from where this final photo is. But from the before and after, really pleased with that. And really happy with how this x-ray turned out as well. You can see just how nice and thick that area of BC putty is. And that's what we're going for here. So anyway, I thought this was kind of a fun one, especially because I don't normally have fillings break like this. But I think that was entirely my fault with the bonding agents, as I just kind of mentioned here. So if you have any other comments or questions, please drop a line below. And hopefully we can get a few more trauma. Not hopefully, but trauma ones are definitely a fun and interesting case because you don't get them all the time. And the more you do, the better you get at them. And that's the other problem is you're never going to have level one great studies because who on earth is going to randomly break their teeth. <laughs> Unfortunately, the studies are all going to be anecdotally based. There are some things we can do, but in this case, I felt that given the presentation of what the patient came in with, that a spec pulpotomy was going to be better than a direct pulp cap or certainly better than leaving the IRM on top of there, just because that eugenol, it, it seems to, when those teeth go, they go in a real bad way. So um, thanks again for watching. And as always, thank, uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>